In this video, I'm checking out the entire Sony APS-C lineup, starting with the A6000 and going all the way up to the A6700. Now, I have a total of nine cameras here. If you want to read more about these cameras or buy them for yourself, I will leave links to each and every single camera that I mention in this video down in the description. So let's get started. So here are the cameras, the A6000, A6100, A6300, A6400, A6500, A6600, the ZV-E10, the FX30, and the newest A6700. All right, so here they are rearranged. The way that I think of these cameras is in three generations. So consider the first row as the first generation, second row, second generation, and third row would be the newest third generation. But we're gonna get to each and every one as far as what are the differences. Let's talk about the similarities first and foremost. All nine of these cameras have very similar sensors, if not near identical. All of them except for the last two are 24 megapixel. And again, they haven't changed much over the years. In the A6300, the sensor was updated with some copper components that allegedly made it better in low light situations, but you really couldn't see that in the real world. And really, even with the second generation of these cameras, the sensor is a different model number, but it appears to be the exact same sensor from what I can tell. Again, in the real world, it's very hard to tell a difference between any of these sensors in terms of performance. Now, the FX30, which was introduced in 2022, introduced a brand new APS-C sensor that is 26 megapixels. It did also add BSI or backside illumination for low light work and so that improved noise performance as well as just efficiency and light capturing ability. Now this is a huge step forward in sensor design. This new sensor is shared with the new Sony a6700. All of these cameras record HD video. The a6000 does 1080p at up to 60 frames per second. Everything from the a6300 until the ZV-E10 records at 4K up to 30 frames per second, and the FX30 and the A6700 have 4K recording up to 120 with a significant crop, but 4K60 with almost no crop at all. The nice thing about all of these cameras is that the 4K is oversampled from the higher resolution 6K sensor, so these cameras are recording a 6K image and then compressing that information into a super detailed 4K video. All of these cameras have built in Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, so if you want to easily transfer photos from your camera to your phone, you can. The autofocus performance of the A6000 was seriously impressive for its time, and that has only been improved with each iteration of these cameras. All of these cameras, as you can see, have the same E-mount, so they can all share the exact same lenses. So that means you can buy a lens for your A6000, and that same exact lens will fit your brand new A6700 or even your FX30. And you can use full frame lenses on these APS-C cameras just as easily. All of these cameras are well built, they are reliable and easy to use. From a convenience standpoint, some things have improved a little bit over the models, which I will get into, but for the most part, you can pick up any one of these cameras and get a very similar user experience. All right, so now let's go through model by model and talk about differences. April of 2014 was the release of the OG, the original Sony A6000. Now this camera was extremely well received and sold exceptionally well. It's the one that started everything. It features 1080p recording up to 60 frames per second, 179 autofocus points, which back in 2014 was pretty revolutionary. No other camera model, not even Sony's own full frame lineup, could keep up with the autofocus of this thing. It shoots 11 frames per second photos and also records crisp and clean HD video. Now it's crazy to think that this year will mark 10 years of the Sony A6000 because if you pick it up and you use it, it still doesn't look or feel out of date. In fact, it feels very similar to the newer camera bodies. I still think that on a tight budget, this is a very useful camera. So the A6000 was great, very popular and successful, and so, it makes sense that in February of 2016, so a couple years later, Sony introduced this, the Sony A6300. Now the big news with this camera was the addition of 4K video recording up to 30 frames per second. 
and the result was very detailed, sharp, excellent 4K video. Add to that the Super 35 mode, and you can get no crop with 4K24 recording. 1080p recording was also improved with this camera up to 120 frames per second, and so for slow-mo video, this was a big upgrade. Again, the sensor on the a6300 got a copper wiring upgrade, which in theory improved low-light performance, and then Sony also upgraded the autofocus system, which went from 179 autofocus points to 425. So they more than doubled the autofocus points. The resolution of the electronic viewfinder was roughly doubled as well. Sony also added a microphone jack, which is really nice for using external microphones. They also added S-Log and several other picture profiles. So for video shooters, this was a big deal. Also was the first camera to have a silent shutter option, so if you're trying to get photos in a quiet place, this was huge. This camera still shoots 11 frames per second just like the a6000. The a6300 also introduced a better built magnesium alloy body as opposed to the composite body of the a6000. This body is weather and moisture resistant, so if you are using a camera outside in the elements, that is important. Overall, this was a huge improvement over the a6000 with many new features and updates. But in November of 2016, it got even better with the release of this, the Sony a6500. And the biggest news with the A6500 is the addition of in-body image stabilization, or IBIS. You can see that printed here on top. It says steady shot inside, and that's Sony's way of marketing in-body image stabilization. And what this is, if you look at the sensor, is the sensor actually moves up and down and left and right. You can see I'm kind of moving it right here as you are using the camera. So the idea is this movement in five different axes allows for some compensation effects so that if your hands aren't the steadiest while you're trying to snap a photo or record a video, this camera makes up for that. Now this did not replace using a tripod or a gimbal, but it does smooth out a little bit of photo and video shake, and it does make it less of a concern versus one of the previous two camera bodies. In addition, the buffer on the a6500 was effectively doubled over that on the a6300. You could shoot at 11 frames per second, for up to 307 images in a row before the camera would stop and process the images. The electronic viewfinder resolution was the same and the LCD screen resolution was also the same, but Sony added touch capacity to this screen. So you could tap a point anywhere on your screen and the camera would focus there, which is nice if you like tapping to focus. Also with the a6500, Sony added S and Q modes, which is slow and quick video recording. They also added some color to the menu system, which is pretty nice. The shutter release mechanism was also updated and tested to over 200,000 actuations, so it was built to last. Sony added some custom buttons with this model, so there is a custom one and a custom two button on top compared to just one custom one button on the top with previous models. And also the grip on this model was improved. It protrudes a little bit further, so it makes it a little more comfortable to hold in the hand. The last thing that I'll say about this camera is the inclusion of the IBIS in-body image stabilization on this model did affect battery life by a little bit and not in a positive way. I'd say that it reduced the battery life by about 15%. And that is it for the first generation of these cameras. All three of these cameras were sold alongside each other and for years. That is until February of 2019 when Sony released the A6400. Now the biggest improvement with the A6400 was the processor. What they did was they took the processor out of the then insane Sony A9 and they jammed it into this compact camera body. This resulted in a huge assortment of improvements. My favorite and what I think is the most important is the improved color science. Up until this camera, Sony wasn't really well known for their color science. Most people, for good reason, preferred Canon colors. But with this one, the colors and especially the skin tones improved 
massively. Autofocus was also improved. It still was 425 autofocus points, but now all of them were both phase and contrast detection autofocus points. So the autofocus accuracy and speed were both improved. In addition, Sony added real-time eye autofocus, which was a game changer, especially for portrait photographers. What would happen now when you tried to focus is that it would track a subject's eye. If it lost that, it would start to track the face, and if it lost the face, it would revert back to object tracking. This made this camera one of the best autofocusing cameras at the time. Another big addition to this is the flip up screen. Now this is something that so many people were asking for and complaining about. Everyone back in 2019 wanted the ability to see themselves while recording, and this is Sony's version of making that happen. And immediately people complained that if you put a microphone on the hot shoe, it blocked the screen. Third party manufacturers made relocation kits and so you can offset your microphone and still be able to see yourself. The A6400 was the first camera with a built-in time-lapse feature. With the previous models, you had to pay for an app to use a time-lapse where now it was included free of charge. Sony also added hybrid log gamma or HLG picture profiles, which is a nice, easier to work with color profile. Another nice feature was the shutter auto white balance lock. The menu system was also improved. At the time, this was the same menu system as on the a7 III full frame camera, just squeezed into this tiny body. The last tab is my menu, which allows you to add your own favorite customizable menu items and quickly have access to them. Another improvement with the a6400 is an outdoor 4K video recording. One of the problems with the a6500 is if you're recording outside Side, the screen on the back would dim automatically either to save the battery or to protect the camera from overheating or a combination of both. For whatever reason, they did that and the result was sometimes you'd set up your shot or be recording outside and you couldn't see what you were doing because it was just simply too dim. They solved that problem with this generation of cameras and with this A6400, so it had a no dim rear LCD. ISO was also expanded with this model to a whopping 102,400 in extended ISO mode. Another huge update is the removal of the record limit. Now prior to this camera, every other camera body had a 30 minute record limit which means it would record for 30 minutes and then it would stop and if you wanted to continue recording you'd have to hit the record button again. This new second generation of cameras that record limit is gone so you could record for hours at a time as long as you had an SD card and a battery that wouldn't give up on you. And lastly, because of the result of the faster, cooler, more efficient processor, the battery life was improved on these cameras, I'd say by about 15% over the A6300. Overall, the A6400 was a huge improvement. It was a massive update, and so it sold very well. And you could see here that it is the update to the A6300. I don't know why Sony released this camera first, but they did. And then in October of 2019, Sony released the A6100, the update to the A6000. And you could tell that this is the update to the A6000 because it shares the same composite plastic body as the A6000. These two cameras are not dust and moisture resistant like the A63, the A65, and the A64, but the A6100 did come with the same flip up screen as the A6400. It had no record limit, it had a touch screen on the back, and it had the same processor and the specs as the A6400. The color science is just as good as the A6400 as well, but Sony did have to distinguish this from the A6400. So they took away a couple of key features. First one is picture profiles were removed. So no HLG, no S-Log. The electronic viewfinder is a 1.44 million dot viewfinder versus roughly double resolution on the A6400. The auto white balance lock was also removed from this camera for no real reason that I can think of. And that was pretty much it for the downgrades. So it essentially was slightly worse build quality and build materials, not weather resistant like the A6400. And so it came in at a more bargain price. That being said, I still think that the A6100 as a whole is a better camera than even the A6500 or the A6300 
or certainly the A6000. This first generation of cameras, I think really is bested by even the lowest tier of the second generation of cameras. So a month later in November, Sony released the A6600, which is the update to the A6500. And the A6600 has everything that I just mentioned in the A6400, but more. First up, this has steady shot inside, which you can see here, which again is IBIS or in-body image stabilization. The performance of this IBIS sadly is identical to the IBIS on the A6500. There are no improvements from my testing whatsoever. What was an improvement was Sony added real-time IAF, which means while you're recording video, the camera would lock onto and track your subject's eye through the entire screen which is incredible. Another huge update was the battery. Now up until this point, every other camera in the lineup was using these tiny FW50 batteries. With the A6600, Sony moved up to a Z-Type or a full frame battery, which more than doubled capacity overall. 820 shots versus 420 shots. Perhaps to accommodate the battery, the grip on the A6600 was also extended even further, which made it by far the most comfortable APS-C camera at the time. Sony added another custom button with this model, so it's custom one, custom two, custom three, and then custom four down here. Another small detail that is important is that the buttons themselves are a bit more pronounced and tactile on the A6600, which is nice for those who have larger hands or if you are using gloves when shooting. Another upgrade is the inclusion of a headphone jack. This is a first in the lineup. So now you can not only record external audio with a microphone, but you can also monitor it with a pair of headphones. The flip up screen is the same as the other second generation models, as well as the touch screen functions. And the last thing that I'll say is that with this A6600, Sony removed the pop-up flash, which is a bit odd. So the A6400 has this pop-up flash, a6600 is, I guess, geared more towards video creation, and so they decided to remove that flash for whatever reason. So now is when things get a bit more fun. In July of 2021, Sony released this, which is the ZV-E10, which according to Sony stands for Gen Z Vlogging E-Mount or something like that. This camera is part of a new, more video vlogger focused line of cameras, and it had a cool number of features, and it became instantly very successful and popular. The ZV-E10 uses the same 24.2 megapixel sensor as all of the other cameras up until this point, but the big news is the addition of EIS, or electronic image stabilization. So instead of having a mechanical IBIS in which the sensor actually moved up and down left and right, this camera used a gyroscope and processing power to crop into the sensor and produce that same stabilization at the expense of really two things. Number one is loss of resolution as you crop in, which can be significant, and number two, a kind of annoying workflow if you want to stabilize in post with Sony's Catalyst software. The ZV-E10's body is unique in that it is smaller than even the A6000. It has a very shallow, smooth grip and build quality that's really not better than even the A6000. So I'd say the build is a little bit worse a little bit cheaper feeling. Now, in order to appeal to video makers, Sony simplified this camera by removing a lot of buttons and a lot of dials. They removed that pop-up flash, they removed the EVF electronic viewfinder, the record button moved to the top and got larger, the mode dial turned into a little button that simply cycled through three different modes. So, photo, video, and slow and quick. There is a background to focus button, which is a little cheesy, and a zoom rocker around the shutter button. Sony did add a nice three capsule microphone on top and included a little dead cat that you could mount to the top just like this. But this camera also does have a microphone jack if you wanted to use an external microphone with it. And then the other big deal is the flippy floppy screen. It doesn't flip up like it does on the A6100. It flips out and it rotates 
like so many people at the time wanted. The menu system, autofocus performance, and video specs and quality were all identical to the other models apart from that electronic stabilization. The thing that Sony really got right with the ZV-E10 was the price, because when it was released for $700 US, it sold insanely quickly and very well. And there were times during the chip shortage where this camera was selling used on eBay for double retail. Insanity. In many ways, this is still one of the best vlogging or on-the-go travel video cameras here because of that microphone that's better quality than really any other camera here. And really, this is a great video camera and a capable photo camera as well, but it's missing that viewfinder and the removal of physical buttons makes this a harder camera to use for photos, especially outside in bright conditions where you can't see the LCD screen. Now, a year and a few months later, in September of 2022, we got the surprise Sony FX30 cinema camera. And what this is, is the very popular, very capable Sony FX3, but with an APS-C sensor, and for about half the price. Now there's a lot to get into with this camera, so I won't cover everything, but I will cover the highlights. As you can clearly see, the size is large. The design and the build is very different because this is not a successor to anything thus far in the APS-C lineup. First up, this is an all new 26 megapixel sensor. And I know it's not a big jump from the 24 megapixels that we've seen up until this point, but this new sensor is a massive leap forward. First, it's backside illuminated, which you can research more about, but in a nutshell, this makes this sensor immensely more sensitive and capable, especially in low light with better lower noise performance. Better light gathering, it's more efficient. It also got dual base ISOs of 800 and 2500, just like the full frame FX3. The second big highlight is 10-bit 422 recording. This is huge for both photo and video as everything else up until this point was at 8-bit and no 422. So the range of colors is greatly improved. The third highlight is the video recording capabilities. This camera does 4K 60, which is a first, and it even does 4K 120 with a heavy crop. This was a first on an APS-C camera. Super detailed, slow-mo, oversampled 6K footage in 4K is something else. This camera also got a bunch of built-in cinematic looks, most important of which is S-Cinetone, which is a color profile trickled down from Sony's professional Venice cameras. If you want to shoot video that looks spectacular without any color grading or modification, S-Cinetone will get you that. The fifth highlight is the autofocus improvements. So the last models prior to this one had 425 autofocus points. This FX30 got 759 of them, phase detection. On top of that, the autofocus includes real-time eye autofocus in video for humans, animals, or birds, which are also animals, but listed as a separate thing. Real-time tracking was also included and customizable, detailed AF settings. Number six, this camera got not only the five axis IBIS in-body image stabilization, but also active mode stabilization. So it's kind of like a hybrid between electronic and mechanical stabilization with a bigger crop. The result is that you can shoot handheld video and it can look as smooth as a gimbal at times. The menu system is completely updated and changed and this is a massive deal. If you own one of the previous cameras, just don't tempt yourself by trying out one of these because it's really hard to go back from this menu to the older menu. Now you can tap and you can change settings just like this, but you could also just hit and swipe from the bottom and quickly change settings just on your main screen. So you don't actually need to hit the menu button and go in and do anything. You can adjust all of this and really change any of these icons for the stuff that you access frequently and have quick access to it at any point in time. This FX30 has dual card slots and it's the only camera in this entire nine-way comparison that has that. It has the flippy floppy screen just like the ZV-E10 and it also has a full-sized HDMI port. 
which is a first on an APS-C camera. It also has active cooling, so there is a fan here that cools this camera in any weather conditions. So you can run it basically forever, even outside in the heat without worrying. One of my favorite things about this camera is all of the tally and recording lights when you start recording. So you hit the record button and there's a red light here, red light here, red light here, and a red box around the screen as well. So it's easy to tell that you're recording from almost any angle. The FX30 in my mind is an absolutely excellent video camera. It is almost strictly a video camera though. It doesn't have a viewfinder. It also doesn't have a mechanical shutter. Impressively, the sensor and the processor on this camera are so good that the electronic shutter takes incredible photos. I made a video comparison about that a while ago, but beyond that, there are so many more things to talk about with this camera. Cine EI, breathing compensation, custom LUTs, the list is long but I think I'm gonna wrap it up right here. And last up, in July of 2023, Sony released the long-awaited successor to the A6600, this A6700. Now, the best way to look at the A6700 is remarkably a better FX30 in a number of ways. The sensor in this camera is the same as the one in the FX30. The video performance is the same, 4K up to 120p. As Cinetone, check. Custom LUTs, check. 5-axis IBIS, check, 759 autofocus points, check. But Sony took this even further by dropping an AI processing unit from the full-frame powerhouse that is the Sony a7R5. So this camera can recognize humans, animals, birds, insects, cars, planes, and adjust autofocus accordingly. This also includes human pose estimation, which is some sort of cheat mode for autofocus. It estimates the location of the eyeball even when the subject has a face that's turned away from you. And in practice, this camera makes taking an out of focus photo or video nearly impossible. Tracking is incredibly good, quick, and accurate. And really, all of these cameras have excellent autofocus systems, but this one is a few steps above the rest just because of that AI processing unit. The A6700 also got the menu system of the FX30, which is great. It got the flippy floppy screen as well and it got a revamped button layout. The record button is on top, just like on the ZV-E10. It's nice and big as well. There is a sub mode dial here, which makes switching from photo to video to SQ mode nice and quick and easy. There's also a front dial here, which is available on the FX30 as well. I forgot to mention that. But these two cameras are the only two that have a front scroll wheel but this is really nice because you can control your aperture, you can control your ISO, and then you can control your shutter speeds independently with three different knobs. Uh, and it used to be that you'd have to go into the menu system to control at least one of those three. The grip on the A6700 is massively improved. It's more pronounced, it's grippier. Now this is a small camera, but it feels as comfortable as holding a full frame camera in your hand. Now I say this is a small camera, but if you look at the size difference between the A6000 and the A6700, it's like these cameras have really grown over the years. And part of that has to do with heat. We are going from 4K 30 to 4K 120 and 10-bit 422 and way more processing and a better sensor. So all of that adds heat and that's a challenge in a smaller camera body. The only little disappointment that I have with this camera is the electronic viewfinder which wasn't improved over the A6600. It's still the same resolution and the same magnification, although Sony did say it was brighter in their words, quote, it's almost as bright as the one on the A7R5. Overall, in my view, the A6700 is a near-perfect hybrid APS-C camera. The only compromises that it makes over the FX30 is that you have only one SD card slot, you don't have a fan, so overheating will occur after an hour plus of video, just depending on weather conditions. So what we are seeing with these recent camera releases is a changing of product lines from Sony. These APS-C cameras that were a trio in the beginning and then remained a trio in the second generation as of right now are no longer a third generation trio. That's not to say that Sony can't release a brand new A6200 as a replacement to the A6100 and then replace 
the A6400 with an A6450, but they are kind of running out of numbers. We will see what happens in the future, but if you are currently out there shopping for an APS-C camera and you're still on a budget, I would steer you in the direction of the A6100 at minimum. I still love and use my A6100 almost every day. I take it with me traveling. It's a very capable little camera. For strictly video work, that is making YouTube videos, vlogs, travel videos, streams, the ZV-E10 is hard to argue against. It's excellent, it has that excellent microphone, very compact body, and a simplified interface that make it suitable for that type of work. If you want an absolute beast of a video camera, then the FX30 is definitely the one to get. I would trust this to record weddings, paid gigs, professional events, it's a powerhouse. But if you also like to shoot photos and you want that viewfinder and better autofocus, the A6700 truly is the premier APS-C camera from Sony. It's also less expensive than the FX30, but as I mentioned, in a few ways, it's even better. The one last thing that I will say is while it's undeniable that there have been a lot of updates to this lineup over the last 10 years, the majority of improvements apply more towards video recording versus photography. If you look at this photo taken with an A6000 and compare it to a photo taken with the A6700, there is a difference, but perhaps not as drastic as the $1,200 price difference would suggest. But in terms of video, these newer Sony camera bodies blow the old ones out of the water. But if you only take photos, you don't need to pay for the newest A6700 necessarily, unless you will notice those 10-bit colors. I think for strictly photos, the A6100 or the A6400 is kind of the best bang for the buck option, as those cameras are about half the price of the A6700. But if money is no object, then definitely go with the A6700. So that is the entire Sony APS-C lineup. Special thank you goes out to Sony because they let me borrow a couple of these camera bodies that I was missing. Also special thank you to my brother for letting me borrow his A6300, which I don't know why he hasn't upgraded yet, but he still likes it. And uh, yeah, that's gonna be it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay tuned for more. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.